Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Big Issue debate today. My name is Rosemary Stone, and I'm the Chief Business Development Officer and ESG Executive Sponsor here at SWIFT. As our industry works to make its business practices more sustainable, it's facing many challenges, challenges which span a huge number of areas, including regulation, finance, and technology, to name just three. Improving sustainability is a complex task with different challenges across different global regions. In some parts of the world, it's about improving basic infrastructure and societal advancement. In others, it's about the need for more reliable data and an increasingly complex regulatory environment. But what we do know is that in all regions, significant shifts need to be made in the way that our businesses are run and large investments from all sectors of society are going to be essential to meeting ESG challenges. And before the pandemic, the UN identified an annual funding gap of $2.5 trillion needed for emerging countries to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. And post-pandemic, that gap has nearly doubled to $4.2 trillion. And the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change tells us that emerging countries need at least $6 trillion by 2030 to meet less than half of their existing nationally defined contributions, their self-defined pledges under the Paris Agreement on Climate. And overall, BlackRock suggests that $4.5 trillion needs to be invested every year between 2021 and 2050 to ensure we limit global temperature increases to 1.5 degrees over that time frame. These are eye-watering numbers. And as climate impacts are increasing, costs also continue to spiral. Over the last decade alone, we've seen extreme weather condition events creating $3 trillion worth of repair costs. And we've seen them on every continent, including here in Canada, where the worst wildfires the country has ever seen are unfortunately still burning. While it's easy to get overwhelmed by the scale of the challenge, the flip side is there are also huge opportunities. For example, digital financial services have been reported as having the potential to add $3.7 trillion to the GDP of emerging economies and to create 95 million jobs. That's a very real impact. And progress is being made on a number of fronts. Over the last decade, the number of adults in developing countries with a bank account has increased by 30%. We also see many new green products being offered to customers in the financial industry, as well as demands for green credentials from suppliers. And the topic is becoming embedded right through business operations, all the way up to boardrooms. So going forward, a key question is how to strike the right balance between providing for the here and now and transitioning to sustainable practices. And how do we ensure that the emerging world gets the money it so badly needs? and we have to deal with difficult and sometimes very paradoxical choices. Is it right that so much focus is being placed on divesting away from carbon intensive en energy sources, for example, when so many of the poorest nations still rely upon them? There are a myriad of questions on this topic and new ones arising all the time. And many organizations say they actually have difficulty moving from intention to action. According to the Global Risk Index, 70% of financial institutions say embedding sustainability into their business models is a critical challenge for them. But why is this? The topic is high profile, it's business critical, and it's time sensitive. And I've barely scratched the surface on some of the challenges and opportunities. But thankfully, we have a fantastic panel here with us this morning to dive deeper into it. And I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating discussion ahead of us. So let me now pass over to Ben Matthews, partner at Beringa, to get us all started. Please come on up, Ben. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Rosemary, for that introduction. And look, delighted to be here today to moderate today's big issue debate, are financial services ready to leap into the new era of sustainable business? 
I'm Ben Matthews, a partner at Beringa Partners, a global management consulting firm. And I've also had the privilege of working with many of you across the Cybos community over the past 25 years of my career. Um, sustainability and ESG continue to be incredibly hot topics. And the ability to integrate these considerations into propositions, services, and your business model offers a huge opportunity, but also with some challenges along the way. Um, helping explore this important topic, I am joined by an esteemed panel representing their institutions, but also, most importantly, many regions from across the world. And if we manage to distill some of the great debate we've had in preparation today, I'll be pretty happy with the job that we've done. Um, right, to my left, we've got Lavinia Bauerhoch, who's Global Head of ESG for the Corporate Bank at Deutsche Bank, also a member of the Global Executive Committee of the Corporate Bank, a member of the Green and Sustainable Finance Cluster for Germany, and co-head of GFAN's Energy and Real Economy Workstream. I've got Gopal Bhagat, Deputy CEO of the Indian Banking Association. It's an association that represents over 245 member banks across India. Vivek Ramachandran, Global Head of Global Trade and Receivables Finance from HSBC. And finally, Susan Yang, General Manager, High Value and International Payments at the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. Right, without further ado, we want to make this pretty interactive and engaging for you all. So I'm going to kick off with a Slido from the get-go. So get your phones at, out and do look at the app. And the question to get us going is, on a scale of one to five, how much importance has your organization placed <clears throat> on sustainable business practices today? It helps us get a gauge for where everybody's at when we get into the substance of the panel. Fantastic, we can get the results up there. I'd say quite a range, actually, quite a mix, yeah? So more placing it as very important, which I think for us is very useful. So I think we've probably got a pretty educated audience here today to engage on this subject with, but also some who really haven't placed any importance at all. So again, we've still got quite a range in those responses. Fantastic, right, to get going. Um, I want to start by asking each of you whether, firstly, your region is ready to embrace the new era of sustainable business practices. And what do sustainable business practices actually mean for your organization? So, Lavinia, um, how is Deutsche Bank stepping up to these challenges? Thank you, Ben, and thank you um, to Cybos for having us today on such a crucial topic. Thank you for the question. Um, so, I would say sustainability or the readiness for sustainability really varies across different regions, but Europe with the EU taxonomy was one of the first regions to start developing a very robust framework, which is still underway, which is also providing one of the challenges. But we at Deutsche Bank really see ESG and sustainability as an imperative and as a new normal. So we put it already in 2019 as part of our strategy review as one of the key management priorities into the heart of the new strategy. And since then, we've taken considerable steps. We've articulated, for example, to facilitate a total sustainable finance volume of Euro 500 billion on a cumulative basis until 2025, which is a sizable number. Um, we've provided transparencies um, by, for example, committing to interim reduction targets for 2030 for our most carbon intensive, intensive sectors. But we also issued, for example, the framework of what business we consider sustainable finance. So it's a cont <laughs> continuous journey the whole organization right. is embarking on. And also on the solution front, um, we've developed an offering which is very comprehensive to support our clients. Mm -hmm. We were very proud of issuing some sustainability-linked supply chain finance programs for our clients. And that's continuing. So the demand is also striving how we are creating responses and facilitate services for our clients in ESG. Fantastic. And sort of build on that, Gopal, for you and your organization, but also your members, how does this translate? Because I assume there's quite a varied understanding and engagement around these sort of topics of your 245 and growing banks. Yeah. Good morning to all of you. And uh, thanks to Cybos. Thanks, Ben, for this opportunity. Uh, see, as far as this subject is concerned, ESG, 
In the recently concluded uh, G20 uh, meeting in India, our Prime Minister has, uh, you know, the theme of the whole function was uh, one earth, one family, and one future. That conveys the commitment of the country in that. And given that we are a 76-year-old association of banks, and uh, we have membership from foreign banks, private banks, and public sector banks, we are presently committed on uh, capacity building with the help of uh, multinational companies, bigger banks. Uh, we are trying to arrange webinars, seminars, so that bankers get complete knowledge about the concept itself, and they get ready for absorbing the taxonomy which will be introduced later. So that's the beginning. So, but we are committed to this. And we've had some great conversations earlier about how the international community can support around a whole raft of opportunities on education, so on and so forth. Yes. I'll come on to those shortly. Yeah. But Vivek, given um, HSBC is a, a big global international bank, what are the priorities for you? What, what does this actually mean for HSBC and its clients? I mean, similar to what Lavinia said, sustainability is one of the pillars of HSBC's global strategy. Right? So transitioning our own businesses is the easy part of the challenge. And we've made public commitments about getting to net zero by 2030. What's more important is the impact we can have by changing our clients' practices. So HSBC is organized around three pillars. Firstly, is helping our clients transition. And being in multiple regions, being in multiple markets, we have, I'm not sure unique, but we definitely have a distinct perspective on the differences across geographies, across sectors. We've got almost 2 million commercial clients. And helping them transition their activities is pillar number one. Pillar number two is helping transition supply chains. The bulk of emissions for a large corporate are going to be scope three emissions, which is in their supply chains. So helping our clients build visibility into their supply chains, helping them use financing as an incentive to transition supplier behaviors is pillar number two. And the third is investing on new technologies and new economies. So it's, it's, I was delighted to see an uh, announcement by HSBC this morning that we are setting aside a billion dollars of funding for new climate tech companies. Because at the end of the day, transitioning today's activities is going to be a big part of the solution, but you need new technologies to come about. And I think banks have a big role to play there. So, yes, hugely important for us, but it extends obviously well beyond transitioning our activities. I guess the theme there is very much around how you support your clients with that transition. Yes. And the technical opportunity here, the technical transition and funding that transition and supporting your clients through that, that process effectively. And finally, Susan, we've talked about your unique position, arguably, yeah? Commonwealth Bank of Australia, one of the biggest banks in Australia, huge payments processor. Same question to you. What are the opportunities you see? And again, you bring that specific payments lens to the answer, I guess, as well. Indeed. I, I'm hoping, you know, I'm a payment person, bring some different perspective to the discussion today. So CBA, indeed, is the largest bank in Australia, and we have the largest customer base. So what does that mean? Uh, one, almost one of two incoming cross-border payments to Australia land in a CBA beneficiary account. And with that, also in domestically, we have sight of about 40% of all type of transactions. Given that unique position, it, what's important for us is to ensure we leverage that rich data asset and provide insights and advise uh, governments and also our clients when they make decisions or policy or investments related to sustainable business practices. That rich data, which includes, for example, customer con consumer spend, uh, loan applications, and also combined with the digitizing payment information, we can really use that to create a lot of opportunities for us to proactively reach out and engage our customers when it comes to all the different aspects related to environmental, so social, and governance issues, and help work with them to resolve those uh, challenges related to the sustainable business practice as well. So I guess if we also look back on the Slido outcome, yeah? So the majority of votes being in the very important bucket uh, around this topic, I guess all the answers are very much in that vein, yeah? Very important to you, your institutions, but also the clients in which you serve. 
And I think that's also the area we want to, you know, drill down into a little more detail on to get some uh, examples around where that's happening, some of the cases, some of the stories that you've actually uh, got to tell. Um, continuing the theme of wider business practices. So what are the most significant opportunities internally and externally for the financial services industry from fully integrating these sustainable strategies into their operations? And what are also the real-life trade-offs? So what are the challenges you see as well as the opportunities? And I think, Vivek, to your point, let's take that both from a client angle and also your own institutions. So who would like to take that first? So I'm going to venture a guess that if you asked a similar audience of corporates on how important sustainability is to them, yeah. the answer will not look the same. And it definitely would not look the same all over the world. So I think that's our first fundamental challenge, is to acknowledge corporates are at different stages of adoption. And a recent survey we conducted said it's only four out of 10 corporates who have sustainability targets embedded in their interactions with suppliers. Right? So we as an organization need to make sure, and we as an industry need to make sure, that we work with the clients and realize they have commercial challenges that are day-to-day -day and actually quite pressing today, and sustainability needs to be built into that, as opposed to be something overlaid on top of everything else that they need to deal with. Just to explore that a little further, why do, you, why do you think that is? What do you think is preventing that prioritization or level of engagement? What, what's the key driver? I think harsh economic realities of doing business today. Life, yeah. I mean, it's a tough economy. Inventory cycles have built up. So companies are destocking. Western economies are skirting with recession. So demand is not coming through. So the reality is a lot of companies are in survival mode. On the flip side, you take a market like India. It's booming. Right? So you have companies can kind of capitalize on growth, invest in digital, understand new demographics that are emerging. So economic reality is good and bad. Unfortunately, today are taking precedence in some cases. And our message is you don't need to be either or. So embedding sustainability into your business practices can be a competitive advantage. Embedding sustainability and financing to drive behaviors in your supply chain can actually build more robust supply chains. So how do you make sure it's not either or? But it's economic realities, I think, which is the real constraint today. Yeah, and Gopal, we, yes. we discussed this, didn't we, as well? Yeah. Love to hear your view. No, very interesting, you know, uh, that is a different angle from corporate side, uh, though I fully agree with you. You know, all the commercial uh, outfits will have their own challenges. Uh, in India, what we find is that uh, we are not as advanced as you are mentioning, like the corpus we have created. But there is a talk about the subject, and I can tell you from the association angle, uh, this is one issue which is being deliberated continuously and there is a focus. We have a dedicated standing committee on this issue, and uh, they are discussing on all aspects of ESG, and uh, they are the real bankers who are involved in financing in credit decisions. And uh, you know, I would like to sum up here, saying that uh, in banking, when we say uh, we have to give equal importance to payment systems, as you mentioned, uh, so as far as payment systems are concerned, I think we are in much uh, advanced stage as of now. The digital transactions are huge in India and increasing day by day. So thanks to technology initiatives uh, by NPCI and by other stakeholders, uh, we are in a fairly advanced stage. Then comes the uh, liability side of the balance sheet, where we can say that we have guidelines from the regulator on green deposits that is already there, is getting implemented. And the uh, third one is uh, financing when it comes to financing. that I will not say that we are not ready for that or we have not done anything on that because, uh, you know, unlike in uh, other economies, we have uh, something called priority sector lending in our country. It is about 40% of the book needs to be in, a, in agriculture or MSMEs. And these are the smaller units, standalone units, which are working across the country. And these are generally kind of, uh, I will say, ESG compliant, you know, though not theoretically or commercially into picture, but they have been compliant. Activities are like that. So, uh, you know, we have colleagues from Dutch Bank, HSBC, and other uh, uh, banks and multinationals who are in much advanced stage. 
I will in fact request them uh, to this uh, forum also. Uh, we can collaborate. We can start doing some work on that. The basic thing is to begin with, you know, we should not wait for taxonomy to come into picture. Before that itself, we can start working on spreading knowledge, awareness, uh, capacity building, even at the board level, at the uh, operational level, that will also help us. So taking it forward from here, I think uh, challenges are there. They are real challenges. Uh, we should not say that it is confined to one particular geography. We are seeing those climate impacts in all the geographies of the world. So matter is really serious and it is, uh, there is no time to delay anything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think you'll be itching would, to get <coughs> onto yes. this one. Yeah. <laughs> I would love to add to Vivek's comments, in particular on the on the climate perspective, because I do have these conversations quite regularly. I'm directly also in contact with my clients on their sustainability plans and strategies. So. We are currently discussing a very complex topics where many clients who don't have the size of a large multinational struggle to find the capacities, the competencies right. to deal with these issues themselves. And we do that in times where we do face our clients as well as us, geopolitical and economic uncertainties. So over the course of the last two or three years, I would, if when I was asked, is sustainability number one priority of your clients, of your corporate clients, I said it might not have been the priority number one, but it wasn't, it wasn't deprioritized either. Nobody is waiting and holding back their developments, but the complexity is one to handle where, as you also rightly say, it requires a lot of collaboration across the industry and also co-creation alongside our, our clients. And um, to me, sustainability is really two sides of the same coin on, from a financial services perspective. Mm -hmm. On the one hand side, we are catalysts for innovation. We are growth enablers. We want to facilitate the transition and finance the transition. With new technologies coming in, when new risk understanding has to be developed as well. But on the other hand side, we are also risk managers. So we do also need to have a view of how ESG risk as financial risks are integrated into our risk management processes. And that's an important dialogue to have with our clients because the availability of balance sheet and the allocation of balance sheet will be considered under ESG criteria for corporates in, this, in, in the future. So that's a very, inform, um, very important piece of development clients need to start engaging with and understanding. I think the, the takeaway from me from that is very much around, for that, as you said, around the commercial reality here. I mean, when you have 700 million individuals who don't earn more than, was it $2.50 a day, there's a very strong driver there and very strong dislocation that we still need to address to get this to become more of a priority. Then to your point there, Gopal, is then about, let's create the, you called it the taxonomy, so the standards in which we can then build to then have these conversations and start to support uh, industries to be more sustainable in what they do. And then, then to your point, of course, is around you know, then how can we help that through collaboration and education? To an extent, I'm paraphrasing, but that's one, one key aspect. And I guess the follow-up question to that is, so given these trade-offs, um, is ESG, or perhaps just sustainability, always value accretive? So to bring that to life, Alex Edmonds, who's a professor of finance at London Business School and author of one of the Financial Times books of the year called Grow the Pie, argues that ESG is like any other long-term investment. Some are value accretive and some just aren't. So I'd love to get your sort of thoughts and responses to that. Maybe, Lavinia, if you could take that one. Very happy to. <clears throat> so I think um, it depends. I think there's no real alternative because one is the, the incremental value created for sustainability, which definitely is, is there. On the other hand side, it's also um, protecting your current business model. So there are always development stages where businesses need to reinvent themselves. And we are in a, in, a, in a reality where business models need to become low carbon and sustainable, not only business model, but also societies. And therefore, I believe the impact is very much felt already. I can truly say if we are conversation, have conversations, for example, with new talents, and so do our clients, one of the first key questions is, how do I have impact in my role if I join your organization? So it's becoming also an element not only for 
the for your competition around clients it's also competition around talent and um, those impacts are just forecasted to be immense so i think there's no real alternative and i think the outcome can be very positive but also the harm can be very negative if you don't adapt quickly or don't understand the materiality of your uh, business and and the other way around on your business yeah yeah for that so uh, I'd, i'd make three points on this the first is To tackle some of the challenges we as a society, as a planet, need to deal with, you need a combination of private and public partnership. So commercial banks are not equipped to take on risks which are 10, 20 years at the scale that you need to rebuild some of the infrastructure required. So on a standalone commercial basis, you need the public sector and you need states and governments to step in. So I think that's part of the value creative point. It's not purely a commercial inter- uh, bank challenge. The second is, as we talk to clients, either you do this on your terms or you'd be doing it on terms dictated by someone else. So in Europe, Germany led with the Supply Chain Due Diligence Act that requires company to attest to the absence of human trafficking in their supply chain. Most companies don't know who is in the supply chain. So is it going to be value accretive in the short term? That's for you to decide on how you use it. But linked to that, your sustainable practices can be a competitive advantage. And how you use that to market yourself and establish your identity is where I think a lot of businesses are missing a trick. And so as banks, we obviously evaluate things purely on risk and return and a social imperative, but we don't get any advantage as capital treatment for sustainable loans today. And so from that perspective, the economics don't look any different from many other deals. But I think from a corporate perspective, there's a huge advantage to be gained. And that's why we have to work with clients as opposed to do it to them. And that plays back, I guess, to your point around the level of engagement around this or the prioritization from corporates per se. It's perhaps not necessarily seeing also the opportunity side of it. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, well, I suspect most people here would agree the economic opportunity in the next decade associated with financing the transition yeah. is going to be the single largest investment opportunity from a global perspective. Right? So everything else set aside, this is an incredible commercial opportunity. I think it, 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 I would equate it to being at the start of the dot-com boom in terms of the new economy that this is going to create. What we as an institution and what we as a sector need to do is find ways to evaluate the risk associated with it, build the appetite, and once in a while, take a leap of faith about funding sectors. So I think that's really, really important. But the commercial opportunity is going to be enormous associated with this. I think I will agree with Vivek here. This is one opportunity which is existing. Only thing is, those who take initiative are going to get more benefit, of course. Yes. And uh, that is, I will link it to the request I made a few minutes back, that this opportunity uh, needs to be needs to get more visibility in our economy. So. Uh, that is going to happen. So it is not only a kind of burden on the economics, basically, of any corporate. It's basically understanding the business, trying to get value. So it is not the return from the business per se, not only the IRR of that activity. If you take into consideration the carbon trading or the you know corporate social responsibility expenses and some kind of subsidies put together, It's going to make sense for the corporates also. So basic question, you know, uh, will be awareness. Now, awareness is not only among the uh, organizations, um, awareness among the corporates, among the public to demand for ESG combined products and services. I think that needs to be uh, given some weightage, at, even at that stage, though we have been talking about this subject for decades. But I still feel Uh, there is still room among us, the developing countries, where we need to draw their focus on this. Yes. So yeah. that, that will also help us. Well, it's good to hear such a rich conversation around the commercial opportunity. I mean, this is the thing we sometimes walk past a little look at the constraints rather than what the opportunity actually is in front of us. Sorry, you had a further... I wanted to just um, add, and I'm also fully with Vivek, how you, how you uh, outlined. Um, I think at the moment we also are still in a position where scalability of investment is not yet an issue, right. but it will become due to the cap- capex spend we will see needed for the transition, and therefore we really need robust capital markets in order to mobilize capital for for what's required, and therefore, in particular, embedded finance, um, the the collaboration around 
different market participants will be really essential, in particular where it comes to new technologies having to be funded and, and which are required for transition, in particular on the energy side of things. Great. It feels like another uh, a perfect time to ask the audience another question after that. So, look, um, given what you've heard so far, this is a challenge, in one word, what is the one focus area that industry needs to get behind collectively to make the most impact? Not an easy question. Suspense is killing me. I think there's a clear <laughs> leader here, but let's see. Fantastic. Right. Shoe pause there. Um, any reaction to that response? I'd love to see if there is anything on there that you think... Um, should have more emphasis or anything missed altogether, or is that pretty much in line with what you'd expect? It's not a surprise that the theme for cyber is to see us collaboration in a fragmented world, right? I mean, there's a saying, to go fast, you go alone, to go far, you go together. Um, so we as an industry need to collaborate, we need to share practice, we need to share data. So I think one of the practical challenges we're dealing with as an organization, I expect many of the other banks you are dealing with, is how do you pull this information together? Right, so as we collect more and more information on our clients' activities, how do you build standards? How do you ensure that the accreditations are transferable? And how do you equip your teams to have these conversations? So ESG sounds simple, but the moment you start digging into it, whether it's the E or the S, every sector, every activity has got different levels of accreditation that vary usually across geographies. So data, I think, is, which is built into a lot of this, for me, is one of the fundamental challenges that we need to get behind. So weirdly enough, in India, I, I'm much more optimistic because you're building a digital stack which has got identity, counterpart of verification, transaction validation. You can build ESG credentials on that stack. Many of the Western countries where we've prioritize sustainability a lot more, don't have the same digital infrastructure with the same data validation and interoperability. So data is something which I think is going to be a challenge. We have to find a way to fix, and it's not every institution doing it. It's in addition to that, we need something that cut cuts across the industry. Yeah, completely agree. It underpins all of these initiatives and efforts, doesn't it? Yes. Any, other, any other reactions before I go on to the next question? I think education is another thing quite important as well, because compared to governments or corporates, they might be much better educated already in the ESG space, but actually the consumers or retail clients, they're also quite keen to contribute to the environment, but they not, not necessarily always have access to the tools and knowledge, you know, how to better measure or monitor their own carbon uh, footprint. So I think to, uh, like what we've done, partner with a FinTech to create those uh, materials and use their spend data, their payment data to help them compare the footprint they are creating compared to the average household average, uh, what we've been seeing, to help them switch potential suppliers, to help them achieve their goal in terms of contributing to the ESG uh, goals in general. So I think that's something we can do more together. Fantastic. I guess a takeaway for me is actually, first of all, the lack of group thing to an extent. There's a big variety of different words there. And also some of the positivity around the terminology used, actually. Yeah. I think um, there's quite a few really positive statements in there around what the opportunity is. Um, Susan, I'm going to come to you first on this question. So when we talk about sustainability, we hear a lot about climate, about lack of standards at times, policy and regulation. But what are the areas that we don't hear enough about, in your opinion? In my opinion, because we are the finance industry, 
uh, we can do a lot more than just climate from you know ESG perspective. The, one of the key elements of ESG is social or societal issues. So what we can do, for example, to help stop financial abuse, which is a uh, it's becoming a major issue with, when we look at the impact on those vulnerable customers. Mm -hmm. So one thing we have launched at CBI back in 2020, we call it Next Chapter Commitment. So it is a bank-wide commitment between the bank and the customers to end financial abuse. So one practical example, what we have observed is the support, support can provide a customer uh, when it comes to technology facilitating financial abuse. So what I mean by that is what we've observed in the payments coming through. The payment description field has been used by those uh, abusers. They actually use that to put really offensive language. Those payments tend to be less than $1. The message in the payment can be very threatening and cause huge distress to our customers. So once we notice that, what we've done, we really use our... AI and the machine, learn, uh, machine learning technology, we can detect those transactions and then we will stop those transactions if certain words are, are identified in the payments. And then if the customer, after warning them, the payer, they repetitively initiate those transactions with abusive language, we actually will offboard those customers. So I think that's something, you know, it's a new type of abuse have increased quite significantly due to the introduction of real-time payments, because that comes with much more characters that people can use to put in the payment discussion. Historic was 18 characters, now 280 characters, plus emoji for every single payment. Unfortunately, in some of those cases, that have been used for unintended purpose. So that's something you know, we are quite passionate about, how to make sure we can use the tools with the technology we've got to help our customers. Another key area when we look at financial industry in Australia, a big focus is scam prevention. Because t the scammers tend to target vulnerable customers. And then with the introduction of real-time payments, it's become really hard to retrieve funds once the customer realizes they've been subject to scam. So a couple of new initiatives we introduced this year, so very new technology. Uh, one of them is we have collaborated with the largest telco in Australia, Telstra. So they've availed us a real-time API. So what we can do, we can use that API to find out when customer initiates certain transaction, whether they are on the phone. Because based on the pattern, we've noticed that's a prime indicator. They are actually on the phone with the scammer. So that can enable CBA staff to ask some probing questions to ask customers, think again, before you make that fund transfer. The second example is in that regard, name check. So what we have introduced is leveraging the past seven years payment data, about 13 billion data points. So when customers initiate first-time payment in any of our digital channels, we will be able to validate the account name against the uh, account number. So we will be able to say, uh, we notice you have made a payment to Ben with this account number. But based on our all the seven-year historical data, that account number always comes with a different name. Do you want to do some follow-up steps? Think again before you press the send button. Just with that simple, with that feature, what has happened is uh, we only introduced that in March. Within that first month, we have saved 11 million potential scams for our customers. And in the past six months up to now, we have seen 260 million occasions giving customers that green risk rating to tell them that uh, they are reassured this is the right account you're making payments to. Yeah. Yeah. The one last example on that is we also deliver something called call a check. Because these days, a lot of you might have received phone calls pretending you could receive a call from the banks. And they will ask you for about all those personal information before you can proceed to the next steps. So customers really start to be very we worried when we receive phone calls. If they're not like a number on their mobile, they hand up straight away. But it could be a valid reason. Customers really need to get in contact with you. So based on customer feedback, what we developed is rather than uh, when we initial phone call, 
we actually trigger a notification to customer's uh, bank app. So they will be able to log into the app, and then one is they are sure that it is indeed a genuine phone call from CBA. But at the same time, they can log into the app to identify themselves. So why is that useful? Just imagine if you are on a train during the rush hours in the morning, you got a call from the bank's help desk team, for example, rather than in front of a carriage full of strangers telling them what's your birthday, what is your address information, you can just quietly you know, take out your mobile, log in, confirm that's me. Then all the uh, next steps can just flow through. So that's another thing being really well received by our customers. Another practical way how the banks can use our technology and then be creative and help a customer combat scams. It's a nice example on the S&G side, which sometimes perhaps isn't explored as much. One thing that's interesting with that as well is that it's, I mean, I was out in Sydney in June at the Australian Bankers Association, yeah. the conference there, speaking mm -hmm. of that. And what struck me was how uh, strong the collaboration was and how top of mind vulnerability was too, and how you can help those most vulnerable in society through such initiatives and mm -hmm. using, you know, we've talked about data, using good data, Technology. interrogating that appropriately. Mm. I guess what wasn't always so clear was how the institutions then respond to that and react to that information. So how do you then protect those individuals once you've actually got the data? And I'm thinking from the other regions that we represent, I mean, is this top of mind? Is this something that you constantly hear about or something that your institutions are also working on? Certainly, <laughs> like, you know, very interesting to hear this uh, whole narrative. Mm. This is an issue I think uh, most of the countries are facing. And uh, of course, uh, awareness is one solution for this kind of problem. But having said that, technology improvements are definitely required. So a kind of, uh, you know, in our association, when we discuss with people who are involved into this activity, uh, one wonderful idea has come up that is kind of formation of a negative registry, like, and then tracking the transactions and uh, trying to stop the transaction as quickly as possible. Because generally what we have seen that the, uh, this type of uh, you know, mysterious transactions take place, they move on at a good speed, you know, from one bank to the other bank to the other bank before they finally withdraw the cash or it yeah. is utilized. So that concept of golden hour, you know, that is that works here also. So those are the things we are looking at. So, so I think Ben, your broader question is there's a lot of emphasis on the E. How important is the S mm. to us as banks and the economies we serve? Usually important. Right? So for HSBC we've got two home markets where we go deep, which is the UK and Hong Kong. And we put a huge emphasis on banking the unbanked, helping the smaller SMEs, and whether it's with financing or digital tools, incredibly important. Short, that would be the short answer to your question. I would, <clears throat> I would add to that an echo of that as well. Um, I see differences in the, in the demand by clients if they want to um, integrate e-related KPIs or social KPIs or governance KPIs. Governments, governance to me is more like the robust foundation many corporates have dealt with over the course of the last 10 years, developed their policies and standards. E is something, in particular in Europe, um, which is a very pressing topic and within the environmental section, decarbonization takes a lot of effort and focus by, by corporates, generally speaking. But it differs across industries and regions. We see more, for example, the social element, both in Asia with supply chain connectivities, but also in, in the US, historically speaking, yeah. there's more now a shift also with the extreme weather events that environmental aspects are coming into 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 mind, and we've seen or we heard very impressively what the technological technological answers to some of the yeah. social um, elements can be. But I think one of the one of the key things might not necessarily be technological, but also looking into the financial literacy of of our our people. Um, so th there's at least in Europe hardly any. 
school driven education provided so um to prevent scam, but also to find more comfortable in the financial sector, um, it's also hugely important to just share this knowledge, not only amongst us, but also amongst our clients and junior clients in particular. So this is something or on the social side as well, the element of social housing will become much more important in the future, depending which market and section you're looking at. So um, as is going to be Definitely hugely important, even more growing in the future, but I think decarbonization will be a pressing topic for some time to come for many clients and us as well. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one thing we were talking about before as well, the pandemic has amplified also social inequalities uh, from healthcare access to economic opportunities. Uh, keen to understand, look, how is the finance industry navigating these new heightened challenges? And I guess what new pressures are your clients facing with their responses? What new pressures do you think they now have? It's quite a tough question, that one. <laughs> it's, uh, I'll take it first. Uh, see, of course, there are challenges post-pandemic. Uh, but what we have experienced is, because of pandemic, the process of digitalization got boosted. So people have learned much more about digital use as compared to the earlier period, during this pandemic period, this learning was much faster. They were compelled to learn, of course, there was no other way. But, uh, you know, when you link it to pandemic, uh, it was an occasion when we had to look back, you know, what we are doing in our economy or what we are doing in our society. See, when we price any product or any service, at this moment, I feel perhaps we are not taking into consideration all the components of the cost. We look at raw material, we look at processing cost, we look at the uh, you know, transfer or mobilization of the product and service and IRR and some amount of profit, and we say this is a price of the commodity. Perhaps we all have been ignoring for decades during this industrialization the impact on ecology, like impact on E part. So that cost is not getting inbuilt into the products and services. Perhaps there is a need to rework the cost which is being uh, you know, given for any product or service, the cost of impact on environment. So whether it is a kind of type one, type two, or type three emission, how the product is affecting those emissions. So while we are producing one product or one service, we should price based on impact on environment also. So during this period of pandemic, perhaps we learned that, that this is one thing which needs to be looked into. So there are challenges post pandemic. And uh, as Vivek said, Perhaps we had a different scenario in our country. The economy is like got a boost. So the growth is much faster here. So I guess the natural follow-up to that is where I heard the price of the product as well. So would you see that going to the consumers of the product? Or would you see that going to some other institutional body? Or would you see that being a tax on the industry? Because I'm keen to explore that, because we can see these, these challenges, yeah? We can see these external impacts and needing to price that appropriately. But where does that go? Does that always fall on the consumer or are there other alternatives we should consider? That's a tough one, Ben, because I'm not sure the consumer is always willing to pay for it. Agree. Right? Yeah. But equally, I don't think it's on us as commercial institutions to dictate how that's allocated. I think that's a broader question for society. So that, I think, is a tougher one for us to handle as individual institutions. I think this gets to the root of the challenge around some of the ESG agenda more broadly, isn't it? It's where that cost goes. And we've talked also about the risk, understanding the risk elements and ensure that you aren't inadvertently moving risk around and passing it on to other institutions or other regions even through some of the approach you take, which I think also means that we have to look at this holistically yeah. and it needs to be, coming back to the word, a collaborative I mean, approach. Yeah? Supply chains have evolved over decades with one singular objective, right? Cost minimization. Yeah. That objective has been met in many cases at the expense of sustainable practices, right? And at the expense of transparency. So there is going to be a cost to transition. 
what we can do is help finance that transition and work with our clients through that. So we can give them access to capital and we can give them access to funding, both for their own activities and to change their suppliers' behaviors. But I think it'll be a step beyond the remit that we have as financial institutions dictate how that cost is allocated to our society. Yeah, absolutely. So Ben, I want to share one example of what we observed during the pandemic. Government tried to come up with a lot of different benefits and discount to help customers who were either retail or small business they were struggling during the pandemic. But the challenge we found, based on what our customers have been telling us, is they actually not sure what kind of new benefits because they are actually are eligible. And the governments, they don't have sufficient data to help identify and reach out to those eligible citizens. So we found what kind of role banks as in the finance industry, what we can play to help bridge that gap. So what we did, we mapped 360 different type of government uh, benefits in Australia. Then we also built a tool called Benefits Funder. So that's part of our inner banking app. Uh, the, logic, the technology is quite straightforward. What do you do? You log in, you answer type of question, and then that will help you identify what type of the benefits you might be eligible for and how much, based on your income, based on the spend data, you might, might be eligible for as well. Then we will point you, based on the answers, to the relevant website so that you can apply for it. That make, make the whole process much easier, both for the governments and also for the citizens. And then uh, we launched that in 2019, but up to now, when we look back, it's altogether about already over one billion in terms of total dollar value customers have been able to claim uh, those from the various governments just after uh, using the benefits funder. So it's another way, again, we have the customer, we have the data, we have the technology to and analyze the criteria for each different type of customer benefits. We make it simple for our client using our technology in delivering the funds from government to the citizens who are desperate in need for that. Just a typical example yeah. how we can help customer in, whether it's a pandemic, it could be some other challenges in the future, but the tool has not been built. I guess we're straying into the space of um, regulations, standards, frameworks and models, which we haven't actually touched on a lot. So do you feel as a panel, you know, do we focus too much time and energy on standards, regulation and frameworks and not enough on hearts and minds, you know, really engaging on the subject? And depending on your answer to that, what more can be done? What do we need to do as an industry with regards to frameworks, standards and models. Uh, I think, Gopal, about your point around what you're looking to achieve in India as well, specifically around having that bedrock, that base in which you can then, I guess, innovate and collaborate. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Any thoughts on that? See, uh, you know, as you said in the earlier question, the pandemic, and uh, I remember Vivek said that India is in a different mood, you know, as far as growth was concerned. See, what happened during the pandemic, uh, there was a continuous work on that, and the small and medium enterprises, they were extended emergency line of credit. And this was done with the backing of government. So around 20% of their working capital requirements were extended to them. This has done very well, actually. And this has given a great help to all the corporates. Uh, having said that, now there are multiple uh, platforms available for extending even the direct benefits, as you said. So uh, women-specific, weaker sections of the society, they were all extended direct benefits through digital mode. And uh, you know, as uh, it was said in the beginning itself, that the bank accounts of uh, adults have gone up by around 30%. I think in India, it has gone up much more than that. That was the basic initiative recently. So looking into in this ecosystem, I think uh, we are prepared now to take it forward to formalization of the customers. As you said, you know, knowing more about them, having database, data points. So same thing is here with us also. We are experiencing that kind of uh, uh, status. 
<laughs> Vivek. I was going to say, look, I think there's a long way to go on standards. We don't have global standards. We don't have global definitions. So I think we have to fix that. And that will simplify winning hearts and minds. Right. Right, so, I'll give, so in HSBC, we've got around 1,000 people who are focused on trade product. Right? Getting them all on the same page, getting them to understand is a non-trivial task because these are difficult issues to get into the moment you get into any detail. And clients don't need us talking about ESG. Clients want us talking about their industry and the specific challenges that they face. So I think standards is an important step to making sure you can win hearts and minds because otherwise this is going to be in the too difficult to solve. I'm sure I'm you fully, want to build on that. Yeah. I'm fully with you on that. Exactly. So, um, I mean, we need robust standards. We are still in, an, in a space where everything is evolving, so we are all struggling, also our clients, to adapt the, to that continuously. I mean, EU taxonomy has over a thousand pages, so it's hard to get through. Um, on the other hand side, I recall the names or some of the words on our word cloud, and I liked speed and courage quite a lot. Because when I talk to clients who I would really consider pioneers in the field, they really felt pushback of now looking at issuances which they have issued and they, which are still in tenor four or five years ago and where now KPIs are looked at, at a more stringent way from the market and everybody else. So we also have to prepare for the, the environment which is criticizing ESG developments while we all ask for more speed and courage. And that's a very tricky thing. So I think on the one hand side frameworks and the standardization, the global harmonization we need will definitely help, but also, also the public dialogue needs to shift a yes. little bit. Yeah. If we want speed and if we want courage, courage, we also need to allow for some period, a journey, a, a, where we all learn, our clients as much as us, and we need to define the standards we want to adhere to, and we need to keep it simple and practical. Very good. Wishful thinking. Well, look, we're drawing to a close. I'm getting, unfortunately, I'm going to ask all of you to work again with another Slido. So the final one is, uh, given today's debate, do you feel the industry is doing enough to respond to the sustainability challenge? We would have been incredibly disappointed if many of you picked number four. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's going up now. <laughs> On that note. <laughs> it's the law of unintended consequences. Okay, I, I, I'd say that was relatively emphatic. Um, more to be done, and I think the panel today we very much uh, explored that. Before we close, so any any final sort of reactions to the poll of those here today? I think we'll agree. <laughs> yeah, I think as a society we, we've got a lot more to do. Yeah, right? and banking as an important cog in that wheel and needs to acknowledge the part we play. And so, completely agree. Almost feels like the beginning of the dialogue to an extent, doesn't it? Given right. what needs to be done still. Well, look, also, we've come I would add, we are in a solutions business. So the second point with the unanswered questions is also opening room for, room for opportunities. Unanswered questions are leading to solutions. So that's, that can be also something very positive. Absolutely right. And I think today we've covered everything from needing to collaborate more effectively educate shared learning across the world with multiple regions they're all at slightly different places different speeds i think the need for collaboration on a global basis to really make some of the interoperable elements work but importantly to best serve our clients yeah at the end of the day they're clients at the end of this and customers that we really need to both protect but also support across what is a very complex and often very emotive subject so I'd like to thank you very much indeed for today's conversation. I encourage any of you also to take the sustainability pledge as well. So the Cyber Sustainability Pledge, I think you go on the app or similar and take that pledge if you feel um, so inclined. But thank you very much for your uh, attendance today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.